I'm from the Tomogamy uh, First Nation. I come from the Bear Clan, and I'm just really pleased to be here today um, to talk about this uh, edited collection, but um, and also uh, the chapter that we wrote within that um, within that book. I do want to say thank you uh, so much to the Center for Pedagogical uh, Innovation for supporting uh, this series of four webinars. Um, I hope that it adds value. Uh, to folks uh, understanding about the importance of Indigenous uh, pedagogies uh, within uh, the education system. Okay, so without uh, further ado, I'll carry on. So um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit first about uh, the purpose of the book and why this book and why uh, we decided to put together uh, this particular uh, collection. So just a really quick story just uh, to set a context for, for that is when I <clears throat> first started teaching in, in higher education uh, many moons ago, <laughs> I'm talking about the 90s, um, I realized, you know, how uh, ineffective I was in the in the classroom, and so I kind of went on this journey about how I could improve my pedagogy, how I could reach students better, and how I could reach a broader range of learners in my classroom because. Um, university doesn't really teach you how to teach unless you take uh, a teacher ed program, right? And so I found myself having to learn those things myself. But at the same time, I was teaching in an Indigenous based uh, program and I, I quickly realized, you know, the standard go to, which is oftentimes a lecture, just didn't work uh, in the classroom and actually you know, I felt bored as well as I'm sure my learners in those early days felt bored. And so when I embarked on my doctoral work, it was actually to focus on Indigenous pedagogy. So in some ways, I was I was kind of disappointed that um, the when I went out to do my interviews that the ind Indigenous students and professors that I spoke with didn't really want to talk about Indigenous pedagogy per se, but they wanted to really talk about their experiences in the classroom and in higher educational uh, institutions. And so as um, Julia pointed out, um, that actually became um, the content for my book called Colonized Classrooms, Racism, Trauma and Resistance in Post-Secondary Education. And so for me, this particular book um, on Indigenous pedagogy, for me, it feels like I've come full circle. So I'm back to where I uh, started, which is, you know, what what can we be doing uh, as educators in the classroom to ensure that we are making the classroom an environment where all students, but in particular, um, my concern was around uh, Indigenous learners, um, places where they could um, excel, feel comfortable, feel safe, but also where we could, um, build on the knowledges that they already had coming from uh, various communities as well as uh, their kin and their communities. And so, and I feel that this book um, will make a contribution to that. So the, the overall purpose then is also rooted in um, work around, you know, transforming um, educational systems so that we are um, moving away from kind of old colonial types of pedagogies, if you will. Um, and so we talk about transforming pedagogies. Um, so transforming the way that we do things in the classroom and also about centering Indigenous knowledges and Indigenous worldviews. So what does that mean and what does it look like? Um, and what do Indigenous pedagogies uh, look and look like? So this the book, um, it, the purpose is around explorations around that and to help folks deepen our deepen our understanding uh, of what Indigenous pedagogies might look like in the classroom. Um, and just so people are aware, Indigenous pedagogical approaches are not necessarily new. Um, you know, Indigenous peoples have been around for a gazillion years, right? 
um, teaching and learning and living and surviving off the lands um, and in their communities. Um, and despite uh, colonization, we continue to do that and we continue to survive and thrive. And so, but but there isn't necessarily a lot that's in the literature. We're seeing it emerge now. And so this notion as well of the classroom to the land becomes really important because there is a tendency in kind of colonial based institutions to always want to separate what happens in the classroom, what happens um, in institutions from our environment. Um, and uh, I, on an individual uh, level, I call that kind of a mind body split in some other work that I've done, but you can see that it, it a lot of times our classrooms split our experiences to those that we experience outside of the classroom and those that we experience in the classroom. But the notion of classroom to the land becomes really important because learning isn't just what happens in, inside of the four institutional walls that we may find ourselves in. We learn from being um, in relation to the world around us and how we then express that learning um, ab about being in the world, but living in the world and thriving in the world. Um, I don't know, maybe some of you were at a, a talk uh, a few weeks ago by Dr. Nagan Sinclair, and he re reminded me of something uh, really important that's connected to uh, the work in this book. And he, uh, he talked uh, about Indigenous knowledges and research and how Indigenous knowledges and research are not only found, for instance, in books or in articles and so forth, but they're actually found in, in artwork, they're found in beadwork, they're found in our drums, they're found in our ceremonies, and they're found um, in, in even some of the experiences that we do when we're working together and building a lodge, for example. And I, and I really um, found that uh, really an important statement that he made around that because that's essentially uh, as well what this book is doing. It's trying to link the classroom to the land uh, and those experiences. So the kind of the overall purpose uh, of the book is to bring uh, then to the forefront Indigenous pedagogies and how we can learn uh, from one another. And for me, um, and, and I know the work that uh, I've done with uh, Taima, this actually takes us on a journey to decolonize uh, our practices and uh, think through what we're doing in the classroom and look at ways that we can indigenize how we approach our work and what we bring to our work uh, as uh, Indigenous professors, for example. So um, I'll move to the next slide. So some of the, the kind of key concepts um, that you'll see uh, covered in the book, um, in, in there's like a broad collection of 10 chapters um, and they, they move through uh, all these kind of different topics from, you know, talking about oral systems of knowledges, uh, examples around circle work and how that's incorporated uh, into the classroom. Um, there's a chapter on land-based learning there's a chapter uh, written uh, about how you can incorporate beadwork uh, into the work that you're doing. Um, and also, somebody has their microphone off, on, uh, so just ask you to do a check. Um, storytelling is really an integral part of Indigenous pedagogy. Um, in our chapter, we talk about amplifying the voice uh, of Indigenous uh, peoples um, in, in the classroom. Um, there's discussion around the concept around all our relations, the art of teaching, uh, also concepts around uh, reclamation and, of course, reconciliation. And so, so the book itself covers off you know, kind of a wide range uh, of different topics that are all integral uh, to Indigenous pedagogy. And I'm sure um, we could probably put together another volume um, and it would tell a whole different story about uh, Indigenous pedagogies because there, it, it, there's just so much that could be written um, and communicated uh, in it. So I'll move to the next slide. So I want to talk um, a little bit about the cover uh, of the book. 
because oftentimes the front cover of of the work of a book gets lost in favor of the written words in the chapters that that come. So oftentimes I, I even find I'm even guilty of this myself. We, you know, we'll look at the book and we'll say, oh, that, you know, that's a really nice cover. Um, but we get we start to dig in to try to, you know, um, get into the writing and, and what's covered in the book. Um, and I think one of the things um, that I've learned over the course of um, time and uh, some of the teachings uh, that I've heard is that, you know, those uh, front covers are really important, um, especially um, if we have, uh, for instance, in this case, uh, an Indigenous artist who has shared some of his work, um, because that in itself um, contributes to the whole topic around in Indigenous pedagogy. And so, in fact, itself, it, it, it is a chapter in and of itself, even though on the face of the page, it's only one page, right? And I think what I, I, I've come to remember or, or come to recall is that, you know, artists, musicians are often the ones at the forefront of a lot of decolonizing work. They tell a story through their artwork um, and through their music. Um, oftentimes, long before it gets picked up in the educational institutions and it starts changing the way that we do things. And so taking a moment um, to talk about the artwork then uh, has become really important, um, you know, to me um, in this book, but as well as the previous uh, book that we had put up out on decolonizing um, and indigenizing education in Canada. And if you just give me a minute, um, I want to read a, a passage from uh, the artist, but this painting uh, was completed several years ago uh, by uh, Sheldon Meek, um, who actually is my brother. <laughs> Um, and when we were seeking a book cover, we were really looking for something that would be meaningful and relevant to what we were wanting to talk about. And um, I had re remembered the story that um, our late mother told us about her father um, and the fox. And that's where this painting uh, actually came from. My brother uh, painted the painting based on a story that was passed down to us in our family system. So my grandfather um, lived off the land. He was a hunter and a trapper, uh, but also uh, a healer. Um, and as well as oftentimes a person that was called uh, when something happened in the community and they needed somebody to help. And so for him, because he was often out on the land, the fox actually was his messenger. And so when the fox appeared uh, to him, when he was out, say, for instance, trapping, he knew he, he had to go back home. And so it became a really powerful messenger about um, where he was needed and um, where he needed to be. And so I just want to share with you, um, you know, this is very short, so I won't be reading forever, just <laughs> so you don't have to worry. Uh, but I do think it's really important that um, we just take the time to context how the chapters link to uh, the works that follow in the book. So the messenger is an interpretation of a teaching that was passed down from my grandfather, Samuel Cote to my mother, Lucianne Cote Meek, who shared with me the spiritual understanding of the fox for our people. The fox is a messenger, and through the imagery depicted in the book cover, I'm reminded that there are many messages that we receive from Shkakmakwe, or Mother Earth, and how important these teachings are to understanding Indigenous knowledges and worldviews. The fox brings messages to the community, and like those messages shared in this book, 
the authors are sharing their experiences and understandings in the hope that Indigenous education thrives. So you can see the really uh, meaningful connection uh, of the picture and the artwork uh, to the content uh, of the book. And so I just really wanted to take a moment uh, to highlight that because a lot of times, you know, like even in the past, I, I didn't really talk a lot about the cover of the book. Um, and I just think it's uh, really important because pedagogically, that is a different way to express um, Indigenous pedagogies uh, and the way that we should be and could be approaching uh, education. So I'll turn it over uh, to Taima um, and she'll talk a little bit more now about specifically our chapter. Taima? There's always that one person that you're going to say, turn the mic on. Kia ora tātou katoa. Ko taima moe ki pipi in toko ingoa. Nō nai tūhoi, nā te pūkeko, nō Aotearoa, tōitū te tiriti. My name is Taima Moe ki Pickering and I was born and raised in uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand, amongst my people. I was raised on our reserve, I was raised by my grandparents, um, and I was surrounded by the language, the land and the culture. So, um, Sheila, actually that was a good segue into the way in which we started our chapter on uh, amplifying and centering Indigenous voices, uh, pedagogy, sorry. But I, I just wanted to read it, and it's it's got this concept called sourcing, Indigenizing is sourcing the sacred, sourcing the sacred. Thanks, Julia, for reminding me of that. So we started the first paragraph, the first thing that we always think about as Indigenous people when we're indigenizing. We're grateful to Creator, Sky Father, Earth Mother, and to all of their children. That's all the winds in between, you know. Like, so we see the universe, and that's why we source the sacred all the time when we're preparing for this lecture, preparing for our classes, thinking about our languages. We acknowledge all the children that look after the skies, the cosmos, the universe, the earth, the animals and fishes from the forests, rivers, streams, mountains and ocean. Thank you for all the teachings so that we could live a good life, so that we could live in harmony and for you to help us replenish our bundles. So many indigenizing actions and activities. They might do prayer or opening circle, or they might um, pay homage to their parents or to the artist or to Sheila's mom or wh whoever, that we're, we're talking to all my relations. So that's what we kind of cover in this in this particular area. Let me go back to my notes now. <laughs> Alrighty, so let's be clear. The job of an Indigenous educator is to amplify, to promote, to alter and to modify. Because we have been told we need to only think one way, and that was usually a Western pedagogy. So part of this chapter is to actually open up your eyes, open up your heart, open up your spirit to welcome other ways of thinking and doing. I love the concept of university because university has the word universe. Imagine what it would be like if we included universal teachings across all of our programs and our teachings. It would be such a different world than we have now. Um, one of the things in our chapter is that we talk a little bit about heart work or ancestor work, that things that come from our heart. As an academic, we were taught that you shouldn't have your heart involved in anything, in any research, in any pedagogy, and, in, and also in your assessment. So this is kind of like a complete turnaround. And for some people, this is a struggle and a challenge in itself. And I ask you to be part of um, the courage and the bravery to bring your own heart work into your pedagogy, to invite your ancestors doesn't matter where they're from. I have ancestors from, from England. I talk about them all the time now. And I bring that into my teaching pedagogy. I know my, I have students on, online right now and they probably were nodding. 
And so I try and balance out. I try and bring harmony. And so that's what we talk about as an indigenizing pedagogy. Um, one of the things that's also in this chapter about be gentle, be kind, especially for those of us indigenous peoples who have had war, violated, we're still violating, there's still violations. The way that we're separated from the land and our family, our language, and I think about my poor mum. I mean, this is a true story. At five years old, being beaten for speaking her language, being beaten for being a different colour. Her name was Namahi at birth. And what's sad is the teacher couldn't pronounce it, so they called her Norma. She goes home and she says to her parents, my name is Norma. And so those are all very traumatizing. I, I'm glad she shared that story with me. I cried with her. I didn't realize that that's what happened to her. And so this is kind of like indigenizing is also being gentle for those of us that have experienced trauma over many generations and trying to find a way to teach a pedagogy that is empowering and modifying, but you're gentle and kind. And I want to read um, a, a, a piece, a quote from our part. Here to you and there. Of course it moved. Okay, where is it? Sorry, just bear with me. Head it out. Oh, there it is. In our chapter, what we've highlighted is an indigenous pedagogy. It's much more than just a method of teaching or practice or assessment. What we highlight is the social, the cultural, the political, and why that matters when applying indigenous pedagogies in the classroom, in your teaching, in your research. Our role is to amplify our own traditions and cultural values, and we validate our own ways of knowing in and out of academia. In this regard, an indigenizing pedagogy is a co-mutual intention between our ancestors and us. A deliberate self-determining pedagogy that upholds our values, customs, cultures and traditions. So that's what you'll find in the section under Indigenous. Decolonizing, you see the word right there, immediately it's telling you we want to dis disrupt. A lot of people say, oh my God, you're going to disrupt Western? They pay you. You know, you got your degree, you got your PhD. I actually have a PhD in psychology. You got your degree from there, aren't you grateful? And so now you're going to disrupt the place that, you know, where you created some of your academia. Inside our chapter, we talk a little bit about Linda Smith. Uh, well, world-renowned Linda Tuhiwai Smith is also from my community, Ngāti Awaki Whakatāne. And what we talk a little, what she talks is that we're not just the academic indigenous in front of you. They've come from a family. They probably speak their language. They've lived off the land. They carry their ancestors in their heart. So decolonizing is to disrupt thinking that we're only just the academic. So I'm, I'm only just a PhD indigenous person, or I'm only just a director of a program. I'm much more. And so we encourage you to think like bigger, bolder and greater more about the people who are in, in your classroom, so your students to the elders that are on your campus. So um, Franz Fanon talks about a new order. So we talk a little bit about Franz Fanon. I love him. I, I mean, I really think that if you really want to start off and learn about decolonizing, go read his book. Go read Albert Memmi. Go read Paulo Freire. These are the architects of decolonization. And then go read Linda Smith and go read all the other indigenous um, profs that were before my time that set the scene. I mean, we, I'm enjoying uh, what they've left behind for us to do and modify and alter here in 2024. But go read other profs, indigenous people. They have already laid some of the groundwork. So we're just picking it up and bringing it into 2024 for, for people to read. So decolonizing is 
not only just to undo colonization, but it's actually to create and modify a new order, another way of experiencing relationships with your indigenous people, students, faculty. It's another way of thinking about uh, relationships with allies. It's another way of thinking about um, how we promote and assess people, all of these sorts of things. So I want to talk a little bit about a deliberate attempt, a deliberate disruption. I would like you, if you ever have a chance, because uh, Eve Tuck talks about decolonizing is action, not doing, seeing, two-eyed seeing. It's actually about two-eyed doing. It's actually disruption and it has to be an action. And we talk about her in our chapter. But one of the things that we've all talked about is the, the twins, the twins of racism and sexism. You really need to know both. So how is your institution impacting the woman? How is it in, in impacting um, like the kinds of sources and resources that you have? Are you actually amplifying a uh, woman's work and research in your chapters or in your classrooms? Are you thinking about inviting more of your students to read a lot more about or, or have other sources about women? So part of uh, decolonizing is to disrupt those twins together. We need to work together all of us because decolonizing isn't just for indigenous people alone it's for all of us to do and i invite you as settlers and allies and colleagues to come together with us so i want to read a little bit about what eve tuck said which is in our chapter and, um, and but eve tuck says even if we're decolonizing we may take different journeys and that's an acceptable process so our partnerships, we might be working together on a project, but when we're in different meetings, for example, I have some colleagues that if there's no Indigenous people at that meeting and Indigenous is talked about, they pick up. And if we are at the meeting, they might look and nod across the room to me and sort of say, do you want to share or shall I share? So it's that kind of co-intention of deliberately trying to disrupt something to add and modify and alter. Um, so I wanted to just share something that, that we wrote. Uh, we, Sheila and I have been both a witness and victim of colonized classrooms, and we've been held back from important milestones in our academic promotion. We could have been further along. We have colleagues that just zoom past us and we're like, why, what happened? What happened there? I, I mean, indigenizing and decolonizing is very labor intensive it's a lot of work we don't stop a lot of people say to me you're doing another book oh you're on another webinar oh you're on that research team it's very and so as a result our own promotion um, was disrupted um, so the root cause is attributed to the systemic racism that exists and is set up to guard a system exclusive for the privileged and so-called intelligent members of society, typically white males. So part of decolonizing, part of disrupting is to look around you and invite more ideas from the universe, more ideas from marginalized groups, marginalized thinkers, um, and start thinking about how you might incorporate that. I just want to leave a note before I hand it over to Sheila to finish off about transforming. But I also wrote something in the in the uh, our chapter, and this is an example of someone who Googled um, Minaba Wadswin, um, Seven Grandfathers, and there was like 800 beautiful, rich sources, but only 36 could be used because they were peer reviewed. So academia reduces our knowing into a little box. And so part of disrupting is being able to say to our colleagues, we don't have to always affirm, uh, you know, peer reviewed articles. We should be ready to celebrate all of the articles, all of the sources that are available for Indigenous resources. Thank you, Sheila. Miigwech, your turn. Thanks, Taima. Thanks. So I'll talk about kind of the last um, section uh, of our chapter a bit. It's around um, transforming. And so really at the core of why we're looking to transform or uh, work towards transforming educational systems, I always come back to this notion about 
um, indigenous con um, Indian control over Indian education. Many of you will, will remember that document that came out, uh, I think it was 1969, and it was, you know, a paper that was put out um, in, in, um, in resisting um, the loss of control over Indian education. And so the focus around why we want to transform a system so that they're more inclusive, that they um, include um, Indigenous knowledges, um, Indigenous worldviews, and Indigenous ways uh, of doing, which really is about Indigenous pedagogy, really, um, is that at the core of that is around um, Indigenous sovereignty. And so, um, and it really is uh, about um, changing systems. So when we think about, you know, we, we need to move our thinking from just um, at a minute level or at a micro level about what's just happening in the classroom, but context that within the larger environment institutionally, um, as well as uh, kind of the world around us. So, and I often uh, find myself um, thinking, you know, what are we doing at a micro level that's impacting things that are happening at more of a macro level? Um, and it's really about transforming pedagogy and Indigenous education. For me, it's really looking about uh, looking at all the broader possibilities of ways of doing, including what happens in the classroom. And so uh, when we think about transforming then, um, I think about things uh, that are related to transforming institutional cultures at all levels, uh, whether um, what happens in the classroom, uh, what happens at the program level, department level, um, at the uh, administrative level, at the executive level. So when we think about uh, transforming systems so that they are more inclusive and that we are mo moving towards uh, decolonization, we are focused on all aspects of that um, system. And we are working in ways that are very intentional. So um, and we don't limit ourselves to thinking about pedagogy as just one um, piece of it, but rather it has kind of a ripple effect throughout the whole system. And so, and change, you know, when we're bringing about changes to systems and introducing uh, different ways of doing, different ways of knowing, um, you know, one of the things we have to keep in mind is that are, is what we're doing going to be sustainable uh, in the long run? Um, and looking at ways that we can put kind of pillars in place that ensure the sustainability of place and space for Indigenous knowledges within some of these systems. And then, of course, um, there has to be a vision about where we're going or what we're trying to uh, achieve, some kind of vision about you know, what we're looking at uh, as kind of, I'll say, an idealized future uh, of where we're going with uh, trying to make change. So I guess um, for me, when I think about transforming, I think about, and I always go back to Indigenous sovereignty. Um, and in my view, it's it's really is time for institutions to, um, you know, step up and create the spaces in classrooms and create the spaces in uh, meetings and, and in, in other ways um, in, in everything that we do within uh, the work that we do um, in education. Um, so this chapter, the, the, it's the, I will say it's the first chapter, written chapter in the book, um, sets the stage for the rest of the chapters that will follow. So in the webinars that follow, you will get um, also glimpses of how uh, other Indigenous um, folks, professors, teachers, uh, community members, also view what Indigenous pedagogy looks like. But this kind of sets the the stage for why change is needed within the academy and why transforming the academy uh, is so important if we want to think about building spaces that are more inclusive and uh, where Indigenous learners in particular see themselves reflected um, in the classroom but also in the environment more broadly and uh, you know I'll just leave you with one last point around that and is that it's also um, ensuring that you know, when they bring 
uh, alternative worldviews uh, into the system or into the work that they're doing um, and so forth, that they um, there's space for that to happen. Um, in the classroom, that professors in the classroom create space and are have some awareness that there are different ways of looking at issues uh, that they might be writing about or talking about or, um, you know, building some kind of podcast about uh, and so forth. And, and those are all relevant. And what we really want to do is create environments where everyone uh, has an opportunity to be successful in whatever way that looks like. So, so that's um, a little kind of glimpse about um, the book itself and uh, also about the first chapter. Um, so I think that's, is that, there's another slide after this. Eh? Oh, okay. Okay, so uh, we don't want to give away all the tidbits in the chapter because <laughs> we hope you'll go uh, and read it. But um, there's a bit of an opportunity here to have uh, a Q&A. And so um, I'd ask if you have questions or comments, just to like jot them down in the chat is probably the easiest way. Um, and we can have time for a, a bit of a Q&A here or a bit of a discussion. So we'll just give you a few minutes to think about that. Here's your big chance. <laughs> Julia, you must have questions. Somebody has their hand up. OK, I can't see that, so. OK, uh, Shoshana? OK. Yeah, th th thank you so much for, for that. Um, it, it lifted my spirit to think about transformation as anything other than cuts and you know sort of the shutting down of programs and all of these horrible things that some of us are experiencing is a sort of collective trauma right now so i'm grateful for for that time to to dream um my only question and i'm so sorry it's really naive um it, could uh we have some uh sharing of ways of accessing the book so that we can buy copies for our colleagues and uh, do all of that. Um, that would be wonderful. I did Google it and somebody was trying to sell it for $450 or something. And I was hoping that there would be <laughs> a way to get it a little more affordably. So thank you. Uh, there is. For, and, thank you. And it, uh, there, I think some of the libraries at the institutions have them, have them now. I know Brock does. Um, because Brock has uh, an agreement with IGI Global, so that's that was really fantastic to hear. But uh, Julia just put a link um, in the uh, chat to a discount code. So uh, for 35% off that uh, IGI Global's offering. So there is, um, what do you call those QR codes? And there's a link there that you can follow to get the discount. Um, it's still pretty pricey, unfortunately. Um, you know, one of the things about working with IGI Global is they have a fantastic support system while you're putting through, um, like working on your edit, edited collection and everything is, um, what do you call that, uh, got a system and uh, it's electronic and everything and I guess that's the way they have to pay for this huge system they have in place, but um, I do understand um, the cost, so I'm hoping that the discount will help. Um, you can also buy individual chapters. You don't have to buy the whole book either, so keep that in mind. So, but thank you for that, uh, Shoshana. Is that I hope I've said your name right. And um, yeah, I see Memorial University has it online for for them there as well. So that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Kellyanne. And Laurentian has it as well. So, so some of the universities have purchased it. And, and I see another question, Taryn. Ami, um, hello. I'm here with my colleagues, Nicole and Paula. We're, we're chiming in from uh, Sudbury at Laurentian. It's not per se a question. I think it's just uh, um, to comment on what Taima was talking about as 
indigenous people supporting each other in these universities. So we just wanted to show you that we are here supporting and uh, thank you very much Chima Gwech for doing this. And uh, I did read two chapters of the book last night. So uh, very good, congratulations, thank you. Thanks for that. And um, it's nice to, to know that, you know, like some, there's more people behind every name, right? <laughs> <laughs> got like three of you there. <laughs> right. She make which colleagues. There is a question, I see a question in the question. chat. Yeah. yeah. So I'm profoundly curious about the idea that academia splits our experiences between inside and outside the classroom where learning happens. Can you comment on one way you see perhaps disrupting that split. Yeah, so, uh, you know, when I think about some of the work that's being done in experiential learning now, there is um, a sense of kind of trying to rebuild that connection between what's experienced um, outside the classroom and what uh, happens in the classroom. Um, that's still relatively new in most institutions, um, but there is a big push for that. Um, within like Indigenous, pedagogical um, views, um, we've always had land-based learning opportunities. Uh, it's become more prevalent in the institutions, but I can remember teaching um, early in the 90s and uh, there were programs uh, in Canada at some of the universities where they had the concept called uh, cultural camps, where people actually went out on the land for like a couple of weeks and spent their learning uh, out on the land. And so with Indigenous kind of um, base knowledges, we've always had that connection uh, to the land. So doing land-based learning, or they uh, there's another name they call place-based learning, um, is not necessarily something new for Indigenous peoples, although you see the writing coming out about it now, but we've always had that. Like, I, I kind of chuckled. I, maybe I've been around too long now, but I kind of chuckled when I when I first started seeing land-based learning being such a big, a big thing. When when I grew up very close to my grandfather, who lived off the land for years and years. I mean, he lived in a canvas tent in the winter with his family and away from the community, and that's how they survived. And so everything that he did was around, you know, survival of himself and survival of his family. So being out on the land was important, and he transmitted those teachings, if you will, uh, to myself. So it, so the split that happens is sometimes I think um, we think we're going to go to school to learn within the classroom and then there so we become disconnected from being out uh, in the environment. I hope that answers some of your question. I don't know, Taima, did you want to add anything? Yeah, just a couple of words and a fantastic question actually. Um, so, for example, at our university, we have the Indigenous Sharing and Learning Centre and, and many universities have Indigenous spaces where you can create opportunities to take your classes to or talk to the elders or whoever's running it as an opportunity to bring students in. They usually do a lot of beadwork, power, all, all types of activities. Um, at our, also at our university, we have a wigwam. So uh, some of the teaching is in the wigwam for all of our class, for most of our classes. So you could use also what's on campus. And I know at Brock, I think there's a wigwam as well. Oh, Longhouse, sorry. Um, um, there's also, we have um, medicinal medicine gardens on campuses. I know that University of Toronto uh, has medicine gardens. So there's, so it's not too far to walk if you can't get out beyond into the, to uh, communities, ideally it would be great if you can go to your um, first people's communities. Another way is, is that what I do in my classes, I usually do, some students love structure because they got five kids and they got three jobs and they need a structured, so they would say, I'll do the essay. But others have got what we call um, a very creative way of thinking. So I might say something like, do an essay or, uh, link up with your local community. I have students who are coming in from Montreal and some parts of UBC. And so um, that encourages them to go out to meet some of the communities or attend different events. And then they come back and they reflect or talk about it and share their experiences. 
So the, the split really is up to the prof. The prof is the one that is going to be able to create that environment. Obviously should be safe and inviting and um, but allows the student to have the uh, ability to make some choices that will add more value to their teaching experience. Very different, I know, from the, the way I was taught at university, but um, that's what we're trying to encourage today. Hope that helps. Yeah, so there's some stuff coming in on the chat as well. So Western University has a wampum uh, learning lodge. I, I have yet to see that. I, I hear it's really wonderful. Um, I can't wait to visit it at some point. And um, Brock's is actually called a teaching lodge. Um, so Julia just put that reminder in there. Um, and then another comment from Patrick, every great idea comes full circle. <laughs> it's those changes in priority. Classrooms aren't inherently the best. So that's a good point too. You know, our learning doesn't only have to happen in the classroom. And I think, you know, as educators that, you know, I, I'm back in the classroom now teaching and I have to really think through what I'm doing uh, because I've done administration for, for so long. So I've, I've come full circle even in my own uh, uh, teaching and trying to think about different ways that um, I can gauge with students. And it, and it becomes really challenging with um, like technology is a great thing, but it can be really challenging, right? Especially when you're doing an asynchronous class, you don't even get to see bodies. <laughs> so you just have words on technology anyway. So there's still lots of work and lots of thinking that needs to go around that. So, uh, but thank you for those uh, comments. Any other questions, comments? I did have a question if if it, I'll let other people think about theirs while I ask mine. I really appreciated um, you discussing how uh, we also need to work actively to dismantle racism and sexism um, as part of, of this work. Um, I have read or heard, encountered like a little bit of tension between um, decolonization and, and EDI as a, as a category. So do you, have you encountered that or do you see those as in the same um, field? I'd like to answer that. Um, you know what's really fascinating about universities and I can't remember, is it Shoshana, you brought it up earlier, that whole concept of scarcity. There's not enough, can only be one person at the top, for example. Or we've, we've been told, and I know we're in budgets right now, every university and there's not enough and there's this fear of competition or fear of missing out or fear of holding on to something that and so we all get part we all fall into that kind of um, uh, defensiveness right as opposed to as you know like let's look at the, the woman marches when uh, Trump first started as opposed to imagine this so when all the women marches happen all over the world there was only a call via Twitter or Facebook we didn't have any money but look how many women marched. So what my point is, is that we can combine our strengths. We don't always have to feel isolated and alone, that you're the only school or department um, that feels that way. And, you know, we treat it as numbers. So one way around that is to change the framework, you know, or, or, or um, disrupt that framework. You're not alone. We are together we can try and find different ways. I just had a faculty meeting last week where we talked a little bit about uh, budgets and somebody had a great idea and I thought, oh, I didn't think about that. And so we re-put that back into budget. So it's kind of like an opportunity to reach out wide, um, reach near, obviously, but it's kind of that hard work again because we all want our programs to survive and thrive. And so it's a matter of trying to work together and learning how to uplift and support one another. And yes, there are some parts of EDI that kind of uh, clash, but again, we need to talk about those and how do we work through those together? Yeah, I, I'll probably take a different uh, take on it, but probably and add to what Taima said, uh, because I've actually done quite a bit of thinking and uh, some writing around like the difference between EDI and decolonization. So. 
Um, I think we all understand what equity is most of the time and diversity and inclusion when we think about those words, how to be more inclusive, how to ensure people um, are able to participate. You know, are we being equitable and fair? Um, you know, is there equity within the system uh, of different people? Uh, are they represented? And then is the is there diversity that exists, right? But decolonization is actually very different than EDI. Um, and I guess for me, because of the work that I did around uh, in colonized classrooms, um, Julia, maybe you maybe you remember this piece, but I I define colonization in a very specific way, and so for me to understand what decolonization is, I have to kind of break that word up into d colonizing and what does colonizing or colonization mean well for me it's around four specific elements one colonization was always about the land and about the resources on the land we never hear that discussed in edi work the land and the resources right um and it was uh, in order for colonization to advance it had to advance with a specific ideology about the Indigenous peoples on that land. And, and that's where we find notions around inferiority, um, uh, you know, how Indigenous peoples were, were viewed as inferior um, and some really other kind of derogatory things that, that positioned them as a, in a very subordinate uh, way. And so, and we know that that ideology is rooted in racism, which is why we talk a lot about uh, work that has to happen around anti-racism. The third element of colonization is that it always um, advanced with a lot of violence, especially against Indigenous people. And we still see elements of that uh, today very real. Like you think about um, Indigenous women and murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls in this country. And not a lot is paid uh, attention to that. I mean, they, I don't even know if they've really done anything with that huge report that they wrote. But that's just one example. And then the fourth piece about colonization is it's ongoing. It, it, it's not a thing of the past. So when we talk about decolonization, we're talking about, you know, things like the land, <laughs> things like the resources in the land and, and the extraction of resources and the extraction and the stealing of Indigenous lands. We're talking about addressing racism. We're talking about addressing the levels of violence that happen uh, in this uh, country. And then also thinking through what that means. So you can see that there's a real difference between what EDI is and what decolonization is, which is I always try to keep them separate because there's this real tendency to say, okay, we're doing EDI work and 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 we're including decolonizing in that, but we're not really because there's no talk about land. There's no talk about violence. There's no, you know, there might be some talk about racism and addressing those kinds of inequities. So anyway, sorry, I, I I no, get kind of rambly awesome. about this. <laughs> it's great. It's a really, it's an amazing answer. Thank you so Thanks. much for, Thanks for, for the question. It. I appreciate it. Yeah, a lot. Um, I will say that um, at Brock, we did read the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women's Report over the Decolonization Circle over two years. And for those of you at Brock, there is an event on February 14th um, uh, about with the Red Dress uh, event is, and there's lots of things happening. So I'll just <laughs> every time I, anybody lets me talk, I'm like, there's these things happening. So yeah, thank you for that answer. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Any other questions, comments? Not seeing any hands going up. Maybe it's a great time to talk about the amazing things coming. Um, so these are live links here. These are still through the Brock um, Experience BU link, but if you are external and you use the form, I can still send you an invitation. And um, so you can, the first one is, uh, the next one is on February 26th and will be two chapters that will be covered, which is so exciting. I don't know if you wanted to talk about them in particular. Um, I'm just really excited to um, have all of these amazing authors come and talk to us about their chapters. Oh, do you want to say anything about them? Yeah, 
amazing authors, really. <laughs> and, and we were so um, fortunate that we got a broad range of uh, folks that wanted to write something and share something. So you can see just from the titles that um, their work is pretty compelling. Um, and I would encourage if you're really interested in learning uh, more about Indigenous pedagogies to try to come to some of these other webinars that highlight the chapters. So anyway, thank you. Yeah, so the top links will take you to the registration page and then the individual links to the chapters are at the Brock University Library. And if you are part of Omni, I think it will take you there too. Oh, but, okay, um, But you can also buy the book as uh, I've shared in the chat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just want to look at, read the one comment. Yeah. Somebody said, a fox walked by their back door this morning <laughs> and he led me to this meeting. Chumigwech for the wonderful presentation. Always learn so much. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, that's actually really... Um, a really good uh, sign to me as well that we're on the right path if you've seen this fox and you're sharing it. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, More fangirls. <laughs> thank you, Denise, for your comments. And thanks, uh, folks. So I don't know if we have any more slides, uh, Julia. Oh, there, yeah. Just our last slide is just to say thank you uh, to everyone for attending. Um, miigwech and kia ora. Um, we um, look forward to the future uh, webinars. And thank you so much for taking time out of, I'm sure, what is a busy day for everyone uh, to attend today. We really appreciate your support. Taima? Uh, I just also want to thank Brock, uh, Julia and your team for hosting us. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. And to everybody that's on today, um, thank you. And uh, keep amplifying, keep disrupting. We need you. <laughs>